And so, if you are perfectly honest about loving yourself, and you don't pull any punches, you don't pretend that you are anything other than exactly what you are, you suddenly come to discover that the self you love, if you really go into it, is the universe. You don't like all of it. You are selective about it, as we saw in the beginning. Perception is selection. But on the whole, you love yourself in terms of what is other. Because it's only in terms of what is other that you have a self at all. So then, I feel that the, one of the very great things that C.G. Jung contributed to mankind's understanding was the concept of the shadow. That everybody has a shadow. And that the main task of the psychotherapist is to do what he called to integrate the evil. To, as it were, put the devil in us in its proper function. Because, you see, it's always the devil, the unacknowledged one, the outcast, the scapegoat, the bastard, the bad guy, you see, the black sheep of the family. It's always from that point, that which we could call the fly in the ointment, you see, that generation comes. In other words, uh, in the same way as in the drama, uh, to have the play, it's necessary to introduce a villain. It's necessary to introduce a certain element of trouble. So, in the whole scheme of life, uh, there has to be the shadow, because without the shadow, there can't be the substance. So, this is why there is a very strange association between crime and all naughty things and holiness. You see, holiness is way beyond being good. Good people aren't necessarily holy. A holy person is one who is whole, who has, as it were, reconciled his opposites. And so there's always something slightly scary about holy people. And other people react to them in very strange ways. They can't make up their minds whether they're saints or devils. And so holy people have throughout history always created a great deal of trouble along with their creative results. Let's take Jesus, for example. The trouble that Jesus created is absolutely incalculable. Think of the Crusades, the Inquisition, the heaven only knows what's gone on in the name of Jesus. Very remarkable. Freud's a big troublemaker, uh, as well as a great healer, you see. It all goes together. So the holy person is scary, because he is like the earthquakes, or better and still, he's like the ocean. See the ocean on a lovely sunny day, you can say, oh, isn't that gorgeous? And you can go into it and relax and float around. But boy, when the storm comes, does that thing get mad. So there is in us the ocean, you see. And Jung felt that the whole point was to bring the two together and uh, by a kind of a fantastic honesty to penetrate one's own motivations to the depths, Jung had a tremendous humor. And he knew that nobody can be completely honest. That you will try and you will have a great deal of success in uh, exploring your motivations and your dark, unconscious depths. But there will be a certain point at which you will say, well, I've had enough of that. Do you see how, in a strange way, there's a certain sanity in that? When a person indulges in a certain kind of duplicity, of deception, there is something, you all laughed when I said that, there's something humorous about it. And this humor is a very funny thing. Basically, humor is an attitude of laughter about oneself. There is malicious humor, or, which is laughing at other people. But real deep humor 
is laughter at oneself. Now, why fundamentally do you laugh about yourself? What makes you laugh about yourself? Isn't it because you know that there is a big difference between what goes on the outside and what goes on the inside? That if I hint, you see, that your inside is the opposite of your outside, it makes people laugh. If I don't do it unkindly, if I get up in the attitude of a preacher and say, uh, you're a bunch of miserable sinners and you ought to be different, nobody laughs. But if I say, well, after all, boys will be boys, and girls will be girls, I mean, we all know, then, then, then people laugh. Now, you see, what's, what's happening when we do that? Now, I passed you around a lot of embroidery to look at before we started. And I'm perfectly sure that you got the point that there's a big difference between the front and the back. In some forms of embroidery, the back is very different from the front because people take shortcuts. In the front, everything is orderly, and it is supposed to be kind of messy on the back side. See, which side will you wear? You've got to be sure you get the front in the front, have the back in the back. The back has all the little tricks in it, all the shortcuts, all the lowdown that people don't acknowledge. And it's exactly the same with the way we live. You know, like sweeping the dust under the carpet in a hurry just before the guests come. I mean, we do ever so many things like that. And if you don't do it, if you don't think you do it, and you think, well, really, I, my embroidery is the same on both sides, see? Well, you're deceiving yourself. Because what you're doing is you're taking the shortcuts in another dimension, which you're keeping out of consciousness. Everybody takes the shortcuts. Everybody plays tricks. Everybody has in himself an element of duplicity, of deception. Because you see, from this point of view that I am discussing, where the web is the trap, to be is to deceive. <laughs>